Philippians chapter number four, if you would. Philippians chapter number four. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But as they were singing there, I got to thinking about <clears throat> all the things we worry about, you know. And uh, wouldn't it be great if we would learn, finally learn to look to Jesus and immediately let him carry that. And he is the one that gets us through. Someone once said, worry is like a rocking chair. You go back and forth and you don't go anywhere. <clears throat> and uh, you can worry yourself into depression, despair. And um, most of what we worry about never happens. I, uh, I like to, I was trying to think of that guy. It's not Tim Conway, but he, he was a psychiatrist. On Bob who? Bob Newhart, yeah, Bob Newhart, real dry sense of humor, and uh, what years ago, back when I was a worldly person, I never will forget uh, watching one of those shows, and these, this man and woman just arguing over senseless stuff, and he just, he just pulled out a sign and just said, stop it. I don't know if you meant just stop it. You know, wouldn't you like to be able to just turn it off right there and turn off all the worry and all the woes and everything? And, and uh, we can do that. We just don't. Years ago when our son was in college, I won't get this exactly right, Joel. You can straighten me out later. But <clears throat> he was telling a story. They were going down the road and uh, there was four of them in the car. And the boy driving the car, his mother called uh, from the East Coast. I won't mention any names. No one in here. By the way, how many know it's hard to be a helicopter parent 2,000 miles away? It's just hard. You say, what is that? Be the president of a Christian school and you'll know what that is. Or ask Mr. Kramer. He'll tell you what it is. So she calls. And she was known to call a lot. And these boys knew her name. They knew all about it. And they, they would always tease this guy. Oh, your mom's going to call. Boy, you're going to be in trouble. How can you get in trouble 2,000 miles away? I'm just now finding out things my son did in college. He's been married for years. And she calls. And she, I don't know exactly what it was. But she was giving that boy a belly full. It was on speakerphone. These guys in the back were just, you know, just. And finally, one of them was forgot that they were on speakerphone. He said, let it die, Wanda. Let it die. <laughs> well, that changed everything. I don't know if the guy about ran off the road. But uh, wouldn't you like to be able to just kind of turn the switch off, all the worry and all the, all the compensation you had to make in your life because of that worry? And ladies, I have to tell you, I, I thought about that while you were singing. If you wanted God to touch my heart in that way. And... Uh, and really the answer is just give it to God. Just turn it over. He'll carry you through and I appreciate that. Let's stand together please reading God's word. And just to cut. I'm actually going to chase a word through here tonight. If you'll be patient with me. I'm thinking about the home. This evening Mother's Day. And so my mind's on that. And I'm, I'm going to talk about just the topic if I could tonight. Look at verse number 8. A very, very familiar passage of scripture. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. Now, these are virtues. These are, these are, are, are life traits that are good. He says, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. So this is more than emotion. And God of peace shall be with you. That little phrase, if there be any virtue. If there be any virtue. I want to talk about that tonight. And I want to talk about the home in particular this evening. And give you just a little idea about that. Let's pray. Father, help us in our homes to go find virtue. In our lives, maybe there are uh, single adults in here that they are their own home. May their home be filled with virtue, as we learn about this tonight. Marriages full of virtue. Children, they will be taught virtue. Help us, Lord, tonight to understand what you have for us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. 
If you would let me, I'd like to do a quick little Bible study here if I could. I want you to hold your place here. Turn please back to Luke chapter 8. Would you do that? Luke chapter 8. We find this word just a few times in the New Testament. And in Luke chapter 8, we have the story of the lady that was afflicted. She had an issue. She comes to the Lord, and you may recall, she thought in her heart if she just touched the hem of his garment, the press was about him. I mean, people just shoving into him. And uh, verse number 45 of Luke chapter 8, we find these words. And Jesus said, Luke chapter 8, verse 45, and Jesus said, <clears throat> who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me. Watch this now. For I perceive that virtue is gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed. Look at this next phrase, healed immediately. And he said unto her daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace. Jesus says here, he says, I perceive, I feel in me. That virtue has gone out from me. Now I want you to look one more place, if you would, in first, or excuse me, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one. In Second Peter chapter one, we find this great truth here, and this is how we're to build our lives and add to several things. But it begins with something very important. He says in verse number 5 of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. What's that next word? Say it. Virtue. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. What is this? I'm speaking tonight on this subject, go find virtue. And I want us to kind of search for that. If you'd let me uh, say tonight, by way of definition, that virtue is a conformity to a standard of right. Some says morality, but it's much more than that. It is to be particular to moral excellence, a commendable or praiseworthy thing, such as quality, a trait, or purity. In Jesus Christ's sense, it is the power to do right, the possession of being right, and the power to do right. What good is it for you to have the possession of righteous living without letting that righteous living work out of you, and the power to do right? And uh, I want to talk about that uh, for just a while tonight. In Philippians chapter 4, the Bible tells us that we should be looking for virtue. Go find virtue. Sadly, most Christians find very little virtue. We are losing our Christian homes, our marriages. We're losing our churches to the world. What happened, whatever happened to virtue? I was talking to somebody just the other day. They were talking about, uh, called, a, called a church. They said, what's it take to be a member in your church? They said, it's a very large church. They said, we, we don't have membership. We don't have membership. He said, well, how do you tell who's, well, we just don't do that. And we all kind of understand that when we're a member of a church, then we're ascribing to the doctors and teaching of the Word of God, that which that church teaches. And so when we step out by faith, we get saved, we get baptized, we join a church, then we are participating in a life of virtue. Now, sadly, uh, we're losing the respect of people around us and the church is becoming a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal because we're not living up to the life of virtue that or the standard that the world has held us to for a long time and that's sad it's making it, making it more and more difficult for us to stand out as the lighthouse that we need to be so I want to talk about going to find virtue if I could do this and I said this earlier let me say it again virtue is not an emotion Virtue is an action. This is something, something that, uh, that we're to do. We could say, well, that person is just a lovely person. Well, that's not an emotion. There's action in being a lovely person. That person's an honest person. Well, 
Just because you tell the truth every now and then doesn't mean that you're an honest person continually. So you're just known as an honest person. That makes it virtue. And no one can go. I want to talk about that. Number one, I want to talk about the doctrine of virtue. Would you jot this down, please? The doctrine of virtue. And we get this from Luke chapter 8 as we work our way through what Christ uh, said there to the lady. We find out that virtue comes from Christ. Virtue comes from Christ. That typo is my fault. I said virtue, virtue comes from Christ. However you want to read it there, but you can correct it later. That's not the guy's fault up there. But virtue, this, this idea of power exuded from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. Get a little amen right there. So he is our standard for virtue. Don't measure yourself up to some preacher, some missionary, some good Christian lady, good Christian man. We are to measure ourselves up to Lord Jesus Christ and his word. So he has a possession of that virtue. And then he said this, when that lady touched the hem of his garment, he said that that left him. What left him? There is a, there is a power that drained from him. So Jesus Christ was all powerful. And you and I are powerful through the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. We're not Christ, but we have power. And so you and I should live our lives in such a way that this virtue can, can come from us to help others, which leads me to the next point. Uh, virtue affects those around you. The Bible says that that lady was immediately healed. And there are others in that press of people that saw that happen. Can I get you to understand this? In the doctrine of virtue, one of the great reasons that you and I should live a life of virtue and discipline ourselves is so, so that we can be the testimony we need to be. Uh, it allows our light to shine. It gives us power in our voice when we speak to others about the gospel. And so virtue affects those around you. And then, of course, thirdly, virtue heals and virtue helps. And so the idea of a person of virtue. The doctrine is that you're a person of virtue not to be snooty or stout-hearted or hard to get along with or a know-it-all. Boy, don't you just hate being around a know-it-all. Somebody just knows everything. The purpose of being a person of virtue is so that you can help other people. Let me, let me bring it down to the home. The purpose of a man of virtue gives comfort to his wife. The purpose of a woman, a wife that is, that is a wife of virtue or virtuous is to bring comfort to her husband. Now watch this. When a man and woman have a home that there is virtue or righteous living, then that spills out on our children. Our children see that. Our children are comforted in that. Our children are not afraid of their, their home or marriage busting up. And so uh, this, this thing of virtue, I think, really starts with uh, individual Christians, but goes into the home. And you and I should be people of virtue. Number two, I said I'd be short. Number two, I want to mention just briefly the destroyers of virtue. Who are the destroyers of virtue? Well, I, as a pastor's perspective, let me give you this. I think one of the leading destroyers of virtue in America and in the home and in marriages is the multi-billion dollar entertainment industry. And I could spend a lot of time on this, but the music you listen to, the shows you watch, the, the, the media that you bring into your home, the media that you have on your phone is continually chipping away at the virtue in your home and before long, there is no standard of virtue. It's destroying us. When your children, when your children get to the place that their heroes are people with no righteous living and no purity, then you're, you've just about lost the battle to your kids. And for you to wind that back in with a teenager, it becomes very, very difficult. That's where you ought to do the old Barney Fife thing. Nip it in the bud. Nip it, nip it while they're young. Because when they become a teenager. By the way, a, a big help with that is keep them in church. Keep them in a Sunday school class. Keep them in a good youth, our, our youth group. And uh, just, just, just teach them. Just, get, just inundate them 
with that which is right and get them around people uh, that are people of virtue. This, uh, I could name names here. I could throw off a lot of things and people, I'm not going to do that. But you ought to just stop and think about who or what is affecting your children. But before you do that, so you don't have any skeletons in your closet, you as a mom and dad, husband, wife, need to stop and ask the question, who's influencing you? And it does you no good to jump on your child about whoever it is out there. I don't even know who, who, who's swinging. And then they get in your truck to go to school and you got Hank playing. Do you get enough amens right there? You say, preacher, come on. Country boy can't survive. We live in the South. Yeah, I get it. I understand. But you are giving a mixed signal to your child. That which you watch, that which your child knows that you do, they watch all of that. And so these are some of the destroyers of virtue in the home. A second one, if you want to jot down, worldly education. I don't mean to sound unkind about this. But if you, if you put your child in, in a, an atmosphere of worldly education, you're going to get the product of that. Please, I beg you, second, think what you're doing with how you educate your child. Education begins in the home. And you should be passing things down as a dad. As a mom in the home. But then when you choose to educate outside of that realm, you ought to be very, very picky about that. And I can say a lot about that. I probably offend half my crowd, but I think most of you know what I'm talking about. And um, let me just go ahead and say this and caution you with something. I don't think Christian college is for everybody. I think that should be the starting place. And I think you ought to jump on the back. I think, I, and I tell our kids in our school where I have influence, I tell our kids in chapel, God has first claim on your life, and you should go God's way and let God call you off of that. Amen. I think if your child's going to go to college, I think, I think a good year or two of Christian college would be great. Bible college would be great. That else gives them doctrine. But I'm saying it's not for everybody, and your child may be going in some particular program that Bible college would not offer them the education. By the way, I, I get all that too. I understand that. But please, listen to me. Please, if you choose to go in secular education, in higher, of higher learning, you need to make sure your child is indoctrinated rock solid before they get in there because those professors are going to pickle their brain. And I know what you're saying. Well, we're going to go to this school and this school. This school. Do you understand who's setting the world on fire right now? And how in the world those students get that indoctrination? So I, I just want to challenge you. We're not going to have a church 20 years from now if we don't keep virtue in the home and virtue of righteous living in the lives of people we love. And then this last one, the destroyers of virtue, the dysfunctional family. The dysfunctional family. The home can often have an unnatural divisiveness that is emotionally destructive. And it fights virtue. Marriages are split up. Sometimes we think the kids can handle it. The kids never handle it. They never. They compensate. They do the best they know how. And sadly, in the line of work that I'm in, I watch children go through a lot of emotional stress and trauma that is not their fault. And I want to challenge you as moms and dads to keep your marriages fresh. Um, I read a statistic late, just recently of the number of young people 14 years and down that go home to an empty house every night. One in five children in America under the age of 14, that's 7.7 .7 million kids go home at night to an empty house. Moms and dads are either split up or gone or whatever. They make their own decisions. When they do that, they have little regard for authority. They answer to nobody. 
And that spills over into society, the community, and even the schools that they attend. And uh, they have very little understanding of this virtue of love and, and what is involved in human relationships because they have none. All that training starts in the home. Let me talk to grandmas and grandpas for just a minute. My mom and dad, my mother's a stay-at-home mom, and I know everybody can't be that. I understand that. My dad went to work. The factory came home. Mom was there. We had a family unit. But our, our grandparents were still living, and they had a huge influence in shaping our lives. I often talk about my grandpa Turner. My grandpa Norris worked a lot, and they lived further away. They lived about an hour from us, and so it was harder for us to be around them. But all of them influenced our lives. And can I say this? That grandparents, especially being in an old, older generation, can teach virtue to your kids, to your grandkids. Do you know your grandkids will know very little about gardening, very little about, about digging a ditch? They'll learn, they'll know hardly anything about farming or cattle or anything like that. Uh, and, and can I say that those little stories you tell influence? And any time that you can, you can put action to that by taking them somewhere or showing them something, you know, I think personally, this is my personal opinion, I think every young boy from the age of, let's just be a little higher so you don't think it's child labor law, but at least age 12 to age 16 ought to go somewhere every summer and pitch square bells onto a hay wagon. <laughs> Not 40, a thousand. I think they ought to have to get up in the top of that barn, not have an elevator to bring the hay up, but to back the truck up there and keep stacking hay in that old hot barn until the, the low got so low that a good strong back boy would throw that bale up there. I don't remember how much they weighed. I, I can tell you that a wet bale weighed a whole lot. But I think everybody, I, I just think that that's, it's just, it's virtue. It's a work ethic that's left us. How many of you men have ever, have ever worked in the hayfield? Would you put your hand up and worked in the hayfield? Glory to God. Hold on. Okay. Why is all your hair gray? <laughs> now I know we have round bells now and all that's of the devil and straight out of hell. That's, there's just no way that a cow would ever eat a round bell. Uh, but, but. Um, our families have they've, they've lost all that if all, if all we ever have is this we're in a heap of trouble when the Russians and the China, China whatever happens oh google it number three write this down these are destroyers of virtue number three I want to consider lastly we need a desperate search for virtue he says, if there be any virtue, if there be any virtue. And I want to challenge you with this. Moms, dads, go look for virtue. Look for it. Get in your home when you go home tonight. Look at your television selection. We had an electrical storm about almost two months ago. It took everything out in our house. Took our security out, our TV out, our phones out. We still had home phones then. It took our garage door opener out. <laughs> it took everything out. And uh, so we're just now, so I thought, well, we don't watch that much TV. So we went ahead and bought a TV. I don't know how to run it. Praise God. My wife, the only thing we, we, we watch is the news and, and game show channel. <laughs> And, uh, but, but I, I honestly, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'll get it. If I don't, I'll be okay. But I challenge you to go home right now and flip on how, whatever you, you're, we don't even know to have channel three, channel eight, channel, we don't even have that anymore. There are no numbers. Whatever you got, that menu, and see what you've been watching. 
Go look for virtue. I mean, things I used to preach on, like a magazine rack and things like that, you know, no one even has one now. We have one beside the bed. There's nothing in it but medical supply, and I stub my toe on it all the time. <laughs> Blood pressure cuff. And... <laughs> but go look for virtue. Listen to yourself talk to each other. Is there any virtue in that? Any praise in that? What are some of the words? Hey, you idiot, shut the door next time. What, what, you know, is that any way to talk to somebody? Look for it. Secondly, defend it. If you have virtue in your life, don't let anybody tear you down and act like that you're some weird person because you have a standard, a principle of living Here's, here's some again, honest, true, just, pure, lovely. Somebody looks at you and says, you just, you're just some old fuddy-duddy, whatever a fuddy-duddy is. Well, just tell them, Rudy Toot Toot, what are you? Dork? I mean, I don't know what to say back. You know, just don't let anybody tell you. If you've got some virtue, stand strong. And keep that. I think about our teenagers. It's hard to be a teenager. Even in a Christian school time sometimes. I come in. I preach in chapel. We've got a sea of faces in here. Pretty much, Mr. Pearson, Mr. Kramer, this middle section, would you say? And, so, and more? All the way back. Just for high school. And... Uh, I know there's, there's different family atmospheres and dynamics and all that. But, you know, I, I just know that some kids that try to do what's right, they have a hard time. And that should not be in a Christian school. I can't stop it. I can do all I can. But if you're one of those young people, you stand for a life of virtue. And don't let anybody drag you from that. You moms and dads do the same thing down at work. I know what it's like to walk in to the power plant. The, the, coal, the coal facility there, I know what it is to go to the break room. We got a bunch of roughneck guys in there. I know what it's like when I worked at the Kaiser Aluminum plant to carry my dinner bucket in there and sometimes sit by myself. I get all that. Look, you can make it. It's okay. Let your light so shine before men. I said, I'd hurry. I got to move on. You look for it. You defend it. And as Peter said, we add virtue to our faith. Maybe you didn't think about this. Maybe you never thought about the idea, if there be any virtue, conformity to a right standard, morality. To be, it's to be particular to moral excellence and code. A commendable or praiseworthy thing, quality, trait, purity, the power to do right when you can do right. That's virtue. If there be any virtue, add that to your faith. I uh, was thinking about all this in Mother's Day, which kind of led me down this route. Can you find virtue in your home? Can you find virtue in your marriage? One man once said that we move from vice to virtue, sin, to righteous living in your life. A lot of people bring a lot of vice into the marriage. They'll bring unsaved people, get saved, and they've got vice in their home. They've got to get out. And we move toward virtue. But I was thinking about all this, and I have found that women in particular, as keepers of the home, are generally the protectors and you might say to find the prospectors of virtue. Now, it don't need to be that way. You dads ought to be able to take your stand in the home in the right kind of way. And, uh, but I, I found, and don't, don't go home and put your wife in charge of virtue in the home because that's what preacher said. I'm just saying they're defaulted to do that because the husband will not take charge. There's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do that. 
But typically it's the ladies that said, ah, 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 get that out of here. Get it out. I watched my mom bring the mail in, stand at the trash can, just start pitching stuff. Get the bills out, pitch stuff. And uh, moms, y'all know what's right. Dads, y'all know what's right. But make sure you're looking for virtue. You keep virtue in the home. Virtue in your marriage. Let's go find virtue.